My dictionary says that history is a chronological record of significant events, often including an explanation of their causes. But I get the feeling that Howard Zinn might take issue with that definition, not because it's inaccurate exactly, but because it leaves people out. After all, he is the historian who called his memoir, You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train. Definitely no armchair historian, this academic activist has been challenging our notions of politics and history for some time now over the course of many essays and books. He has two new collections of his writings just out from Seven Stories Press, Howard Zinn on History and Howard Zinn on War. But then again, it's always a good time to Howard, have Howard Zinn on this show, and I'm very pleased he could join me again on New York and Company. Oh, Hi. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, do you uh, ever get the feeling that you've seen it all the uh, that uh, <laughs> I mean, Santiana said history repeats itself. Uh, many people say that's not true, but do you get a feeling that there are certain cycles that you see happening again and again? You know, I, I don't see them as cycles. I see them, you know, as spirals. <laughs> that is, as, uh, you know, a spiral. It comes back to the same point, but at a different level. You know, so sure, there are persistent things that happen again and again. Wars. <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh, They never go away. They, they never go away, but, but, but they differ in, in their particularity, and they differ in the rationales given for them. You know, at one time, the rationale for going to war was Nazism. Then the rationale for going to war is communism. Then the rationale for going to war is some dictator, <laughs> right? Uh, so... Yeah, things, there are certain persistent themes in history. And you don't see any reason for going to war? No. <laughs> no. Since I, you I bring s- it up. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I did bring it up. Uh, no, I don't see any reason for going to war. Uh, and I say this, on, the, on I guess, on the basis of several things, on the basis, one, of my own experience with war uh, in what was the best of wars as, you know, the good war, World War II, uh, and uh, and on the basis of history, on the basis of history, what have wars done for us? <laughs> well, uh, well, your own experience, you were a bombardier in World War yeah, II. right. And then you became a pacifist, or another way of looking at it, you were a shop fitter at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, eventually, mm-hmm. you try to put yourself out of work. I tried to. <laughs> what do you mean? Try to put myself well, I mean, out of like work? if you're if you're against all the things that you were uh, working on at the Brooklyn Navy. Yard. Oh, 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 I see. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess you know you can argue that uh, if you uh, do away with war, you put a lot of people out of work. It's you know it's it's like you know that man who was mayor of this little town in Utah where nerve gas was being manufactured. And, uh, of course, nerve gas is very, very deadly. It had already killed several thousand sheep. And people asked, and, and he didn't want the nerve gas plants to, disip, to go away because, it, you, know, you know, he said, you know, this is our life. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, we, we have to put people out of war work and put them into peace work. But if people find this really hard, everybody wants to end war. Yeah. Pacifism mm. is relative for most people. Mm. They're very much against certain wars. Right. But then how do you deal with uh, the Vietnamese invasion of Cambodia to end the killing fields or uh, some of the actions that have quelled the ethnic cleansings in the former Yugoslavia or when the Tutsi army finally ended the genocide in Rwanda after 800,000 people had died. Well, you know, the, I mean, you can p- probably find uh, particular instances where a relatively small amount of violence stopped a great amount of violence. Uh, I'm not an absolute pacifist. I don't even use the word pacifist to describe myself. But I am, in general, against war. And even wars that mostly pretend to be doing something good. I mean, you mentioned the bombing of Yugoslavia and, you know, in the time of Kosovo. And, and, and I, mean, I mean, there was an example, you know, I think of where, yeah, something bad was going on. We go to war and something worse happens. And, and everybody agreed to that. It got worse. And in general, war makes things worse. And the worst thing, and this is, to me, this is crucial. War in our time and for some time now, is the indiscriminate killing of large numbers of people, whatever the purpose is. Uh, And the means generally overtake the ends. 
And in general, the uh, victims of war are children. And so whatever good purpose there, there is, uh, always proclaimed by the leaders, and I know I trust the leaders to define the good purposes for me, uh, the end result of war is the killing of children. And so my point is that whatever tyranny exists, whatever border is crossed, whatever country is invaded, uh, and after all, governments tend to respond to these things selectively and uh, not on the basis of moral purpose. Whatever those things happen, they, we have to find ways of dealing with them without the indiscriminate killing of war. What about the hardening of our sensibilities? Uh, it dawned on me one day that whenever I looked at the world in brief in the New York Times, which is usually mm -hmm. back on page 6 or mm -hmm. 8, uh, there would always be a little thing that said Iraq, uh, U.S. bombers uh, uh, responding to some infraction, dropped uh, some payloads on some yeah. part of Iraq. Yeah, that's been going on. Ever since the end of the Gulf War, we've been bombing Iraq. Most of those bombings go unnoticed in the press and therefore unnoticed in the public, and yet people are killed. The people who are killed are not Saddam Hussein. The people killed are ordinary people. And yes, we have become hardened to that, partly because the, the, the maybe mostly because the press uh, does not pay attention to them. Uh, and so it goes on. The excuse, always an excuse given when people do find out about it, or when occasionally, as in the recent Bush bombing of Iraq, uh, you know, notice is taken. The excuse is always, well, on the other side, they're preparing weapons of mass destruction. Nobody has prepared more weapons of mass destruction or used them more than the United States of America. You uh, were turned around by your experiences during World War II. Well, you no. mentioned two missions that you, the, uh, a lot, the one in Pilsen in Czechoslovakia, the other in the town of Royan in France. No, I was turned around, not at the time, because at the time, I'm, I'm, the, the bombing of Royan, this little town in France, which I participated in, uh, participated in as a euphemism <laughs> for, for dropping bombs on people. And, uh, and, and wait, wait, let's talk about that for a moment. Yeah. A bombardier yeah. sits up there in the bomb bay or whatever in it the was. Nose. In, <laughs> in the nose of the plane. In the nose. And you had a little uh, thing in your hand like a, a well, push don't, button. Don't make light of what I have in my hand. <laughs> no, there's, a, there's, a, there's something called the Norden bomb site, which was a sort of very you know, secret and presumably accurate device, but which was not true at all when you drop bombs from 30,000 feet that were not accurate at all. Even now with smart bombs, and they don't always oh, seem that smart. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's always this nonsense about how, you know, we're, it's an accident when we kill civilians. It's not an accident. It's not that it's deliberate. It's just that it's inevitable. And when it's inevitable, it's not an accident. So you had this thing in your I hands. Had a, I, I, I'm working the bomb site, yeah. And, uh, and uh, in, a, in a f essence, the bombardier flies the airplane in the last part of the mission, and he flies the plane through the bomb site to the target. So I participated in this bombing of Royan three weeks before the war was coming to an end, and everybody knew the war was coming to an end, and there was no reason for another mission. There were just a few thousand Germans down there holding, waiting for the war to end. They weren't doing anything, but we were trying out napalm, you know, and uh, we... And that early. I, uh, we were doing napalm in World War II. I didn't yeah. realize that. Oh, yeah. That was the first and maybe the only use of napalm at the end, right near the end of World War II. We did wasn't called napalm at the time. They told us, oh, today in your bomb bays, instead of demolition bombs, you're carrying 100, uh, 30, 100-pound canisters of jellied gasoline. I had no idea what it was. We went over, uh, you know, and uh, destroyed the German encampment, destroyed the town of Rayon, and for no reason at all. And... And that, at the time, I wasn't thinking, I know how atrocities are committed in war because I, I, I participated in them. And uh, they're, they're, you know, they happen because people make a decision at one point, oh, we're the good guys, they're the bad guys. Once you make that decision, you don't question anything anymore. Why do you think we dropped it? Because we had developed it and we wanted to see how it worked? That's Is one that reason. Simply? Yeah, that's one reason. Same thing with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We had to, you know. Well, we there, there, you, you're <laughs> going to get into debates with an awful lot of, of course, people oh, over that one. Yeah, of course. I'm happy to get into debates with an awful lot of people about that one. <laughs> but, yeah, well, that won't certainly. Here's napalm. Yeah, let's. Let's try it out. Another reason is there's a certain momentum created by the buildup of military power. 
yeah, the war is coming to an end, but we have all these planes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we have all this equipment. We have these trained people. You know, we can't let them hang around. <laughs> Let's do something with them, regardless of the human consequences. Is that why you think uh, we're developing this missile defense when there is really no threat at this point? In fact, anybody who might try to commit an act of sabotage in this country wouldn't send a missile. They would do it in another way. Yeah, yeah. Well, so much of this building of the Star Wars missile defense, the $300 billion military budget, is based not any real threat to the United States. I mean, there is no country in the world, you might say, that should feel less threatened than the United States. Oceans on both sides, a huge population ready to resist. But right? we did have the explosion of the World Trade Center. Oh, oh, sure. But uh, That's uh, it, I think, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but that's sure. There can always be acts of sabotage, which are more likely, by the way, the more we uh, involve ourselves militarily all over the world. I mean, the more we are militarily engaged, the more people we kill in other parts of the world, the more we become subject to acts of terrorism. And the more weird, irrational things happen. Did you read the defense of the destruction of those huge Buddhas by the Taliban? They said they did it because the world has not come through for them because of all the starvation of people in Afghanistan. Yeah. You know, terrorism is universal, and we always recognize it. When, when somebody else does it. When somebody else does a s- really stupid and senseless act and then tries to rationalize it, we call it terrorism. When we go over and bomb and kill people, you know, you know Reagan, remember Reagan, Reagan dropped bombs on, on, on Libya, you know, killed a, a bunch of people, wh- you know, why? To send a message to, you know, Gaddafi and Clinton, dro- you know. And uh, these are acts of terrorism. If you define terrorism as the killing of innocent people for a presumed good purpose, then governments have committed acts of terrorism far beyond the individual acts of terrorism committed by these terrorists. So uh, they're all just people sending messages? The difference is <laughs> it's uh, amazing. that <laughs> it's when amazing. we do it, we call it sending messages. When the terrorists do it, it's, it's trying to well, scare us. Well, they're sending a message, too. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, how do they justify killing innocent people? Well, you know, we, yes, we're trying to make a point. And we're always, all of us, all the governments are tr- always trying to make points uh, and, and without any concern for human beings. My guest is Howard Zinn, Professor Howard Zinn, author of Too Many Books for Me to List Right Now.